Hello, I'm Leslie Fitton. I'm a curator in the Greek and Roman department and welcome to my corner. I've recently been working on an exhibition about Troy, at the heart of which is a section on the archaeology of this city, which is both a place in reality and a place of imagination. The archaeology of Troy will always be associated with one name, probably one of the most famous archaeologists ever in the whole world, and that is Heinrich Schliemann. And I want to talk a bit about Heinrich Schliemann because he's such an interesting character, such a remarkable character, and I'm a tiny bit obsessed with him. Schliemann began working at Troy, well, he first visited in 1868, and the pursuit of Homer's fabled city had by then been engaged in for almost two centuries on and off. There was a huge controversy about whether Troy really existed, whether it was just invented by Homer, or whether there was a real place to find. By the time of Schliemann's first visit in 1868, the general consensus was that Ancient Troy was at a place called Pinabashe in the northwest corner of Turkey, still called the Troad then as today. Schliemann went there, he did a couple of days of excavations and he found more or less nothing much. But then he went to the mound called Hisselik. The reason he went to Hisselik, which is where Troy is, was because of the help of a local resident. You know, lots of people who are famous for great discoveries don't really exactly start from nothing. They're almost invariably working on the basis of research that's already been done. And Calvert was an amateur archeologist. He owned land and at the edge of his land, he dug what he thought was a really promising site. But Schliemann had something that Calvert didn't have, and that was money. He came to Troy at the age of 47 as a very rich man. Following Calvert's advice, he dug at Hisselik for a very short time in 1868 and then for seasons in the early 1870s. He was a pioneer of archaeology and he recognised that this site was a tell, a mound built up of artificial settlement debris, but he had a real fixed idea in his mind that Homer's Troy, the Troy of the Trojan War, was going to be at the lowest level in the tell. So he employed a huge number of workmen. It was like a giant earth-moving exercise. He dug a huge trench from the north to the south, right into the heart of the mound, moving vast quantities of earth. It was chaotic, but not many people at the time knew any better. But it wasn't unsuccessful. What Schliemann found in the lowest levels at Troy was indeed a strongly fortified citadel. He said to the world, I've done it, I found Homer's Troy. He was a great self-publicist and his finds were hitting the headlines in, in Britain and all, uh, all the European newspapers. There was a lot of chatter about, has he really done it? Is it really Homer's Troy? What exactly is this eccentric German businessman going on about? There were lots of criticisms of Schliemann. He was a self-taught as well as a self-made man. And the academic establishment found that sort of quite hard, really. So people were dubious, some people were excited, some were doubtful. But then in 1873, he made a find which would really put his, his dig on the map. He found what he wanted to call the treasure of Priam, and it included the jewels of Helen. You'll see, he gave everything a Homeric name. The treasure of Priam was gold and silver vessels, some bronze, some ingots, some other precious materials, and wonderfully elaborate jewellery. So, of course, people did start to take him much more seriously in the sense that they realised that he had found something important, though not everybody was believing that this was to do with Helen or Priam or Homer's story of the Trojan War at all. Now, Controversial at the time, Schliemann carried on being controversial later. And it's that sense of the controversy surrounding him that I just wanted to say a little bit about today. Before we do that, though, I also want to tell some Schliemann stories. I'll try to do this quite quickly because I mustn't go until midnight. But he really was the most extraordinary person even before he got to Troy. As I say, he was already 47 when he got there. Self-made, immensely rich man. How did that happen? Well, he was born in Germany and he was the son of a Lutheran pastor. He was born in 1822. 
And he came from quite a poor background. He was taken out of school at the age of 14, put to work in a grocer's shop, heavy physical work. But he tells us in his own autobiographical account of his life that he already was in love with the dream of Troy, with the idea of Homer and the stories. He says that he was given a kid's book when he was seven, which showed an artist's reconstruction of Troy burning. And he says, I said to my father, I must one day find Troy. It's all very romantic stuff. Then he says that he met a drunken miller who could recite Homer and so he used to buy drinks for this man because he fell in love with the sound of ancient Greek. He didn't learn it for a few more years but we'll come to that in a moment because what he actually did do was take ship to go to Colombia um, to go and seek his fortune. Unbelievably the ship was shipwrecked and he was washed ashore on the coast of the Netherlands so to more or less clinging to a spa and with just the clothes he stood, stood up in. He bounced back from that experience and got a job in a shipping agency in Amsterdam and this was the beginning of his business career. He rapidly progressed and he began to work in the indigo trade. He went to St. Petersburg, made mega bucks trading in indigo. He also went to California to the gold rush and set up a bank for the miners with their little uh, bags of gold dust, made money there. He then came back to Europe and cornered the market in saltpeter at the outbreak of the Crimean War. And saltpeter is um, an ingredient of gunpowder, so it rose in value. And he made yet another fortune. He bought property in Paris and other places. One way or another, life was very good for Schliemann financially. But Schliemann, the man, in his sort of middle years, wanted something new and different. He wanted a new challenge and he wanted an intellectual challenge. He wanted really to become part of the sort of republic of letters. He wanted to be acknowledged as expert in some field and archaeology obviously appealed to him. And that is the background to why he went uh, in search of Troy. As I said before, he was helped by uh, Frank Calvert and he found what he found. But to get back to the controversial nature of Schliemann, when I was a, a new curator here at the British Museum, this is going back to the 1980s, um, an old colleague uh, said to me, look what I've just come across in the Greek and Roman department archive. It was a group of letters which had not been properly archived and had got sort of more or less disregarded. And I was absolutely thrilled. These letters are complete gold dust. So they're letters from Heinrich Schliemann in the early 1870s when he was working at Troy to a man called Charles Newton, a very great scholar who was at that time the keeper of the Greek and Roman department here at the British Museum. And what fascinated me particularly about hearing Schliemann's own voice in these letters was that although he said to the newspapers, I've solved all the problems, I've found Priam, I've found Helen, um, to Newton he says, there are problems with this. He sort of started to realise that he'd gone down far too quickly through the various layers in the tell at Troy. And although he had found a fortified city, it was very small. And he was thinking in a very realist way. He was in love with the Iliad, with the Homer story. He was almost working with the Iliad in one hand and spade in the other. And so when the city was so small, he said, good heavens, he says to Newton, it's scarcely larger than Trafalgar Square. How could it have withstood a 10 year siege? Very realistic thinking. He's absolutely expecting to find the Troy as described by Homer. He was also disappointed by the level of material culture. I mean, the pottery he came across was sort of quirky and interesting little pots with owl faces, human faces, we would now say he thought they were owl-faced Athena. Um, it was low level, it wasn't, it wasn't golden goblets and, and the, the sort of paraphernalia of, of heroes and the heroic age. He was disappointed by that. And the other thing too was that if he was going to say this is the Troy where the Greeks fought the Trojans, he kind of felt he had to find a link between Greece and Troy. And there was no such evidence of any link. So he, so he in his own private thinking, did recognise that there were some problems with what he'd found. He tells Newton about the discovery of Priam's treasure at quite great length. A lot of these letters are very long, very detailed. But one of the reasons that the treasure was controversial was that critics at the time, and some subsequently, started to say, just a minute, this is too good to be true. He's claiming to have found Homer's 
Troy. He's claiming to have finished work at the site, this is in 1873, and then conveniently, at the last minute, just when he's about to close the dig, he finds this wonderful hoard of rich things. Who's he trying to kid? People said he'd had it manufactured by goldsmiths, or he'd found it in various places in the site and just gathered it together to make a big splash. Various theories were put forward. It's quite interesting to think that at the time that I published these letters back in the 1980s, nobody knew what had happened to the treasure of Priam. Uh, it eventually was to emerge in Russia. It's now in Moscow in the Pushkin Museum. Uh, but that didn't happen to the 1990s. Uh, in the 80s, the treasure was thought to have disappeared and it could easily have been uh, melted down. But in the 1990s it was of course possible for scholars to re-examine the treasure and it isn't actually full of fakes and forgeries and it is actually a relatively coherent group. So you may think Schleeman vindicated and to a large extent he is and it's no part of my project um, to, to, to sort of cast too many aspersions on a man who is justly renowned and justly great but the letters here have an example of Schliemann at his absolute worst when he is telling complete porky pies and admitting to doing that. So let me just read to you. This is what Schliemann put in his own tome about Troy, one of many publications. I cut out the treasure with a large knife, which was impossible to do without the very greatest exertion and the most fearful risk of my life, for the great fortification wall beneath which I had to dig threatened every moment to fall down upon me. But the sight of so many objects, every one of which is of inestimable value to archaeology, made me foolhardy, and I never thought of any danger. It would, however, have been impossible for me to have removed the treasure without the help of my dear wife, who stood by me, ready to pack the things which I cut out in her shawl and carry them away. That gives you a flavour of the way Schliemann tells his own story. It's full of drama, it's full of excitement, it's full of romance. Writing to Charles Newton, a formidable Victorian scholar and a, and a very upright man, it, he revisits the story of the treasure, and in this letter, in the careful plastic cover, in this letter, he says to Newton, on account of her father's sudden death, Mrs. Schliemann left me in the beginning of May. The treasure was found end of May. But since I'm endeavoring to make an archeologist of her, I wrote in my book that she had been present and assisted me in taking out the treasure. I merely did so to stimulate and encourage her, for she has great capacities. That is possibly Schliemann at his worst. It is a huge porky pie. It's not only a, a, a lie, it's a lie in, in a published volume. By any standards, we don't know what Charles Newton made of that. His eyebrows must have really shot, shot through his hairline, I think. So was Schliemann a consummate liar, or can we trust anything that he says about his findings at Troy? Well, obviously, we can. We have the material that he discovered. To my mind, I think that his tendency to exaggerate or even to lie is much more connected with his accounts of himself, this romantic account he liked to give of the poor boy made good, the, 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 the young man who overcomes all difficulties to make a great archaeological find. I think it's in those terms that Schliemann, as a liar, uh, uh, tends to emerge. And even then, it's interesting, you know, he was a bit self-aware. He wrote in a letter to his brother, My greatest faults, being a braggart and a bluffer, have yielded me countless advantages. So, he kind of knew what he was doing. Everyone's a bit of a package, aren't they? He was a great man, a great archaeologist. He was probably a terribly difficult man. I find myself pondering whether I would really have liked him if I'd had to deal with him in any way. But still, to my mind, I still admire Heinrich Lehmann. Thank you for watching my episode of Curator's Corner. If you want to know more about Schliemann, about Troy, the exhibition I mentioned, there are details appearing on the screen below me now.